Jean-Jacques Rousseau is, in many ways, a radical uh, thinker in the history of Western civilization. In certain ways, he is the antithesis to someone like Thomas Hobbes, and in other ways, he is kind of a compatibilist between, uh, say, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. Uh, He's a very interesting figure, one of my favorite early modern philosophers, along with, uh, as I mentioned before, David Hume. And reading him is just an absolute joy. He is, I think, one of the uh, most exciting, most fascinating, witty, just lovely uh, writers to read out of all the philosophers, maybe, that you can uh, try and learn from. So, he was born in 1712 in Geneva, Switzerland, died 1778, just outside Paris, France. He moved around for a while, uh, having grown up in Geneva, Switzerland. A lot of things didn't work so well. He's kind of an outcast uh, for many different societies, Geneva, eventually France at one point in time. He had to leave and flee France, actually, for his life, uh, who his friend David Hume, he... Uh, uh, corresponded with, and Hume let him live with him for a while in England, and then eventually uh, Rousseau went back to France. He was a, a, a person who was very famous, and so uh, courted a lot of friendships, uh, acquaintances, but also would eventually find those friendships to be broken because of just the kind of character he was. There's something about Rousseau where people couldn't stand him for very long. Even Hume at one point in time, Hume and Rousseau had a falling out, even though Hume is known as one of the kind of most charitable uh, human beings of all the philosophers that have uh, perhaps lived. Um, some of his works include, well, the, I guess the most famous ones, a Discourse on the Sciences and the Arts, Discourse on the Origin and Basis of Inequality Among Men, A Meal or on Education, and The Social Contract or Principles of, of Political Right. So in this video lecture, we'll be discussing the discourse on the sciences and the arts, known as the first discourse, and we'll be discussing roughly the first half of the discourse on the origin and basis of inequality among men, or just the second discourse, as it's also known. And then the next video lecture, we'll pick up on the second half of the second discourse, and then we'll uh, discuss some of the social contract. So because of Rousseau's uh, talent in writing, he has so many famous quotes, but I think probably the most famous quote is the one he begins with in the social contract, saying, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. What a profound statement that, you know, paradoxical, that human beings are naturally part of our human nature. We are free beings, and yet we are in servitude. That paradoxical, um, the, 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 the way in which this famous quote is paradoxical, perhaps sums up Rousseau's philosophy to be a bit paradoxical, but not, of course, uh, contradictory. So his philosophy, though paradoxical, is not, um, you know, I incomprehensible or anything like that. Uh, there's nothing perhaps, you know, logically wrong with it uh, in terms of just, you know, general uh, er errors or anything like that. So we wouldn't say it's contradictory, his philosophy is contradictory. But there's this kind of uh, mystical element, I guess, to his philosophy where he can say such profound things like that, these uh, antithetical statements, and attribute it to human beings as a whole. So why? Well, we'll begin with that. Why is man born free and everywhere he is in chains? And I think these two video lectures that we'll uh, discuss with Rousseau will really, I think, explain why he says that. So, the discourse on the arts and the sciences. So this is the first text that Rousseau uh, wrote that really put him on the map. 
So this was the question asked actually by uh, the Academy of Dijon in 1750. The question was, has the restoration of the sciences and the arts contributed to purifying or to corrupting morals? So has the resurgence after the Dark Ages, you know, we have in, in classical antiquity, uh, you have the birth of reason, and then yet with the collapse of the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages, you have this roughly thousand years where there just appears to be darkness in the Western world, and there's been no progress made since those ancient thinkers in Greece and Rome and the greater Mediterranean world. So this essay Rousseau writes, this discourse on the arts and the sciences, this actually won him the prize by the Academy of Dijon. And it made him so famous, actually, that when he uh, went to England, when he had to flee France, he went to a uh, play with David Hume, and he's sitting up there in the, the boxes, you know, for the rich people, and apparently the Queen of England spent more time staring at Rousseau than she did the actual play. So apparently that's how... Uh, famous he, he was. But this question about the restora restoration of the sciences and the arts uh, has to do with, uh, in its relation to morals, has to do with this question of has uh, not only just this restoration, so bringing it back, of course, with the Renaissance and then leading into the Age of Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, not only just has that increased uh, the moral quality of human beings, but do the arts and the sciences actually uh, make possible moral progress in humanity? And so morals also is understood in a broader sense, the way especially Rousseau here is uh, speaking about it, meaning uh, also including manners and customs, just the general ways in which we deal with one another, not necessarily specific uh, virtues. Um, so first, and I should say, maybe you've already picked up on this with the uh, man is born free and everywhere is in chains. Rousseau, part of what makes this essay so famous for Rousseau is not just um, the way in which it's written, which is really a joy to read, is fascinating, but it's also his argument because contrary to basically everyone else in uh, the Western world at that time, minus uh, a few uh, set of people I'll mention in a moment, uh, Rousseau did not actually argue that uh, basically the Enlightenment project had um, improved the uh, moral goodness of uh, humans. But there were another group of people that did also argue against um, the use of science and, and the arts and, the, and promoting those because they argued, no, it actually made us morally corrupt. That comes from a more uh, religious place. That is not Rousseau's place. So his argument is not a religious one. Instead, he actually takes the role of criticizing Western modern civilization within the context of Western modern civilization. He uses the very education to criticize that education. So... What is the Enlightenment project, or just more generally, what is Enlightenment? What is meant by that? So this is a very problematic term, uh, this question, what is Enlightenment? There are many different answers given, and in fact, uh, soon after the second video lecture on Rousseau, we'll see with Immanuel Kant, he has his own answer to this question, what is Enlightenment? But... I want to just give a, a basic general understanding without any maybe specific definition and uh, deeper meaning behind enlightenment that maybe we'll see with someone like uh, Kant. But just generally, the enlightenment was this movement which sought to use reason as the chief, what we could say is flame or light that is embraced to battle the dark of superstition and myth. So, in many ways, 
Uh, we've seen this actually a little bit before when I mentioned with uh, Rene Descartes, and he wanted to, you know, where he said, oh, of course, you know, uh, some people want to try to just uh, prove the existence of God using the Bible or talk about belief, but Descartes said, no, I want to try and use reason to prove that God exists, right? So there's this um, centuries-long movement to try and use reason where we can have quantifiable certainty about things like the existence of God, things like uh, the, the earth, the world around us, and ourselves. So the uh, Enlightenment is not just simply the use of reason generally, but there are specific things in which it's used. So, for example, it is an attempt to improve human civilization using this rational calculation. So, of course, developments in mathematics relating to ge geometry and engineering. And in general, along the lines with that, it is an embracing of the idea that there is progress, that there is linear progress, right? That throughout time, you have uh, human beings that kind of are savages. And then with the ancient world, you have the birth of uh, reason. And throughout time, it goes up. And then maybe through the Dark Ages, it went down. But then with the Renaissance and so on, progress continues. And finally, we can understand it as an attempt to explain the world and the human predicament through the use of reason just generally. So not just uh, things involving humans and like moral progress, but the world more generally, where we see, of course, the disciplines of physics takes off eventually, uh, and all the ways in which we, astronomy and so on, all the ways in which the world is uh, understood in a quantifiable sense and not simply based on uh, belief or myth. So Rousseau says, while government and laws provide for the security and well-being of assembled men, the sciences, the letters, and the arts, less despotic and perhaps more powerful, spread garlands of flowers over the iron chains with which men are burdened stifling them the feeling of that original freedom for which they seem to have been born, make them love their slavery and fashion them into what are called civilized peoples. Need raised thrones. The sciences and the arts have strengthened them. So this is a really profound statement from Rousseau. That, and I'll leave this last uh, part here. That... Uh, while the government and the laws provide security, right, that the sciences and the arts stifle in human beings that feeling of the original freedom for which it seems human beings were born for, to do as we please. And we talked about this with uh, Locke and Hobbes, just that general idea of, you know, the state of nature, that if there's no government, you're free to kind of do whatever you want. That government, though, while providing security seems to have made, Rousseau argues, human beings love their slavery, love their, maybe sometimes we could outright say, oppressors. Why? Well, he's arguing that the sciences and the arts actually work to strengthen uh, the power of the sovereign, the power of the state. But it's not just about the state. It's about society more generally in this abstract sense of it's not just about the government coming in and having laws and telling you what to do. But Rousseau is saying it's down into the uh, finite minutia of the ways in which we act. Right down to our customs and manners. In all those ways we are enslaved. So why? Why in all these ways are we enslaved by including, you know, our, our manners and so on. So Rousseau says that civilized manners are taught, that passions reinforce a borrowed language. That what he argues is all the ways in which we think, oh, this is how I need to act. And uh, if I don't act this way, it's not proper to me and it's not good. Those are things which kind of tear at our uh, human nature and mold us into being certain human beings. 
And we have to train ourselves and to have these passions and drives, which hopefully if they're the good kinds, uh, reinforce then those manners that, you know, polite society deems good. So contrary to that for Rousseau, natural morality, placed under no constraints, if there was no government to constrain us, is more straightforward and honest. That there's something about then, because we have to be taught ways in which to behave ourselves among a people, Rousseau is saying that's actually a way in which we are more deceitful in civilization, because we have to mask maybe sometimes our true feelings uh, around one another and play a certain role in society. Uh, so let me look at some examples of this on page 13. So he says, Today, when more subtle study and a more refined taste have reduced the art of pleasing to a set of principles, a vile and deceitful uniformity reigns in our morals, and all minds seem to have been cast from the same mold. Incessantly, civility requires, propriety demands. Incessantly, it is customs that are followed, never one's own genius. One no longer dares to appear to be what one is. And under the perpetual constraint, the men who make up that herd called society, placed in the same circumstances, will do all the same things unless more powerful motives deter them from doing so. One will therefore never really be able to know those with whom one is dealing. To know one's friend, one will therefore have to wait for momentous occasions, right? Those, and there's actually sayings of this that we acknowledge about how maybe you don't really know who someone is until they're put in a situation where maybe they haven't been trained for, right? A, um, a moment of crisis, and then you see who someone's real character is. That is, to wait until it is too late, though because it is these very occasions for which it would have been essential to know him. But, as Rousseau is saying, society masks those and teaches and praises deceit. Now, of course, uh, this is not seen outwardly or consciously of deceit. It's seen as, no, behave yourself, act appropriately, play the part. But for Rousseau, there's something that is insincere about that. And there's something about that insincerity which is ultimately, as we'll see later on, vain. Now, it should be understood, though, that these vices of deceit, as he's been explaining them, are not something that just exists only in modern times. It's not something that only existed or, or came about in the Enlightenment and existed, you know, exists now that this is something universal throughout all of human civilization. So, he asks this question, are these, are, these, sorry, are these vices emboldened by the sciences and the arts a contemporary evil? And his response is, no, gentlemen, the evils caused by our vain curiosity are as old as the world. And you might think, well, sure, but I mean, it really seems like now we have, you know, a, a lot of vices, you know, relating to consumerism and so on that, well, how can he be so sure that maybe it isn't just a problem of now and we need to revert to some traditional values? Well, Rousseau is going to give some examples, and we will actually come to more modern society a bit later. So on page 15, uh, Rousseau says, Behold Egypt, that first school of the universe, that climate so very fertile beneath a brazen sky, that famous land from which Sesostris long ago set out to conquer the world. It becomes the mother of philosophy and the fine arts and, soon after, the conquest of Cambyses, then that of the Greeks and of the Romans, of the Arabs, and finally of the Turks. So even in Egypt, we have the uh, promotion of vices, uh, at least relating to um, those of conquering and subduing and enslaving our fellow human beings. 
But then, too, behold Greece. Formerly, he says, peopled by heroes who twice vanquished Asia, once in front of Troy, and once at their very hearths. Nascent letters had not yet carried corruption into the hearts of its inhabitants, but the progress of the arts, the dissolution of morals, and the yoke of the Macedonian closely followed upon one another, and Greece, ever learned, ever voluptuous, and ever enslaved, no longer experienced anything but a change of masters in the course of its revolutions. And then it is in the time of the likes of Aeneas and of the Terence that Rome, founded by a shepherd and made illustrious by farmers, begins to de degenerate. But after the likes of Ovid and Catullus, of Martial, and that crowd of obscene authors whose names alone alarm modesty, Rome, formerly the temple of virtue, becomes the theater of crime, the disgrace of nations, and the plaything of barbarians. This capital of the world ultimately succumbs to the yoke it had imposed on so many peoples, and the day of its fall was the eve of the day on which the title of arbiter of good taste was given to, was given to one of its citizens. Uh, one more. So on page 16 he says, But why seek in remote times proofs of a truth for which we have endur uh, enduring evidence before our eyes? In Asia there is an immense land where literary honors lead to the state's highest offices. In, uh, if the sciences purified morals, if they taught men to shed their blood for the fatherland, if they animated courage, the peoples of China should be wise free, and invincible. So what he's referring to is roughly in this time, uh, you know, the, the 17th, 18th century in China, there is this promotion of civil service where a lot of people in China are educated and they go on to be lawyers and, and civil servants and so on. But Rousseau says, to, so if there would be any example of this promotion of arts and sciences, well, maybe we would see it at least in China. But he says, but if there is not a single vice that does not dominate them, not a single crime that is not familiar to them, if neither the enlightenment of government officials nor the alleged wisdom of the laws, uh, of what use have all these learned men been to them? What benefit have they derived from the honors bestowed on them? Is it to be populated by slaves and wicked men upon which China depended on, just as all of Europe prior to the abolish, uh, abolishment of serfdom depended on? How is it that we could say the promotion of the sciences and the arts promote morals when he's saying, look at China, which seems to, in his time, gone the farthest, and yet slavery still persists? So then he references Socrates, and he's not alone in this. It is common for philosophers often to uh, praise Socrates or see that they in some way really understood Socrates, while all the other philosophers really never understood Socrates. Um, but at this point, Rousseau cites Socrates, who recognized the genius of the poets, and yet rejected their sophistry, while simultaneously praising his own ignorance, because Socrates famously says, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. So on page 18 here we have, uh, this is a paraphrasing um, Rousseau attributes to Socrates and it's supposed to take place in the Apology when Socrates is on trial. But Rousseau writes, from the poets, continues Socrates, I went on to the artists. No one is more ignorant about the arts than I am, speaking you know, as Socrates here. No one was more convinced that the artists possessed some very fine secrets. Yet I perceived that their condition is no better than that of the poets, and that both of them have the same bias. Because the most, skilled, the most skillful among them excel in their speciality, they regard themselves as the wisest of men. 
This presumption altogether tarnished their knowledge in my eyes. As a result, putting myself in the place of the oracle and asking myself which I would prefer to be, what I am or what they are, knowing what they have learned or knowing that I know nothing, I answered myself and the God. I want to remain what I am. So, uh, continuing, we do not know neither the sophists, nor the poets, nor the orators, nor the artists, nor I what is the true, the good, and the beautiful. But there is this difference between us. So here Socrates is supposed to be, of course, saying why he is different than the poets and the sophists in general. That although these people know nothing, they all believe they know something, whereas I, if I know nothing, am at least not in doubt about it. As a result, this entire superiority of wisdom that is accorded to me by the oracle amounts simply to being fully convinced that I am ignorant of what I do not know. So, if Socrates were alive in Rousseau's time, of course, would he praise the Enlightenment sciences and arts if, you know, at this point in time in the past we say, well, of course, because the poets and all these other sophists, they didn't really know what we know now because now we have science. So surely maybe Socrates would praise the sciences and the arts now. Well, Rousseau says to that, no, gentlemen, that just man would continue to scorn our vain sciences. He would not help to enlarge that mass of books with which we are inundated from every direction. And he would leave behind, as he did before, as the sole precept to his disciples and to our posterity merely as the example and the memory of his virtue. So even Socrates, Rousseau says, would see the same thing occurring now in our, or in his time, and certainly now, at least Rousseau thinks, in our time. That there is sophists all among us, and that we still, Rousseau would argue, that Socrates would argue, we still are living unexamined lives. So in a way here, um, Rousseau is seeing himself as a Socratic figure. Now what about the origin then of the sciences and the arts? Because of course, maybe at least if we say, well, okay, maybe Rousseau, you're right. Uh, the project of the sciences and the arts and the enlightenment, it really hasn't purified our morals, but it's made us maybe more vain and deceitful of one another and praising certain vices that maybe involve gluttony. Maybe at least in the beginning, the origins of the science and, sciences and the arts was good. But Rousseau says to this, whether one leaves through the annals of the world, whether one supplements uncertain chronicles with philosophical research, human knowledge will not be found to have the origin that corresponds to the idea one would like to have of it. And so he has some examples, he points out, that astronomy, he says, originated from superstition. That eloquence from ambition, hatred, flattery, and lying. Geometry from avarice. Physics, vain curiosity. The, and specifically in this case, by meaning vain curiosity, he means that this idea that human beings can master the world, that we are these kind of chosen beings that can use reason and become gods among the animals and the physical manifestations of uh, the universe. And even, he says, moral philosophy has its origins in human pride. So, Rousseau says, the sciences and the arts, therefore, owe their birth to our vices. That even when we want to look at the sciences and the arts and say, well, there's actually something noble and pure there about uh, wanting to develop these uh, different skills and techniques and disciplines to understand the world and, and maybe be better people. Rousseau is saying, no, actually. It was done for uh, vainful purposes, to better ourselves at the expense of others. So here we really get the kind of paradox uh, for Rousseau here of the sciences and the arts. So quite simply, 
civilization comes at a price. What is that price? Well, it's luxury, licentiousness, and slavery. Now, certainly, slavery and licentiousness, you know, we could say are wrongs, but why is luxury necessarily a wrong? We'll have to come to that in a moment. But first, Rousseau says, um, well, well, actually, sorry, uh, what is this paradox? Well, it's that luxury barely, rarely proceeds without the sciences and the arts. Why? Well, of course, when we increase our knowledge of the world, we're better able to produce things. The more efficiently we can produce things, the greater the riches of the world become, and the greater certain individuals especially become. But it's not just that luxury rarely proceeds without the sciences and the arts. It's that, more importantly, the sciences and the arts never proceed without luxury. Now why? Why would the sciences and the arts never proceed without luxury? Well, think back throughout most of human history. Well, actually I'll give two examples, and then I'll get to the one about uh, that I was going to talk about. First, why was it that the sciences and the arts and the birth of reason, why did that come at a particular time in human history? Why was it not present with us throughout all of human history? And it would be that, well, you need a certain amount of luxury to contemplate the world, right? If you don't have a certain amount of resources, well, you can't then devote a large amount of your time to uh, studying mathematics and discovering uh, laws of the universe. Also, think about the fact that most people throughout human history, and still much today, you have to be rich if you even want to study the sciences or the arts. So Rousseau says, what must be concluded from this paradox so worthy of being born in our time? And what will virtue become when it is necessary to enrich oneself at any cost? The ancient politicians spoke constantly of morals and virtue. Ours speak only of commerce and money. And I think there's a lot true to that, you know, because we, uh, in this time, this was just beginning but now we live, I mean, at the most advanced capitalism has ever been. We embody, we have naturalized the Protestant ethic, this ethic of always seeking to maximize our time. Am I being lazy or should I be more productive in my time? If I'm being lazy, I'm bad. Being productive is good. So therefore, I always need to produce things and increase capital, increase profit. And Rousseau saw this, the early stages of it, especially in his time. But then, again, consider uh, about this fact that most of those people, if you wanted to study the sciences and the arts, you either had to be two things. Already born into a rich family, so you have the resources to devote time to studying the sciences and the arts. Or, you needed patrons. You needed rich people to, of course, subsidize your ability to study the sciences and the arts. So consider what he says here from page 27 to 28. Rousseau writes, This is how the dissolution of morals, a necessary consequence of luxury, leads in turn to the corruption of taste. That actually, not only does uh, the sciences and the arts make possible greater luxury, but then in turn, of course, luxury makes possible greater sciences and arts. But Rousseau is saying it's a degraded improvement of the arts. A degraded improvement specifically when he means the arts, things like our taste in things involving music and, you know, sculpture, painting, those kinds of, uh, uh, the liberal arts. He says, if by chance someone among those men of extraordinary talent is found who has firmness of soul and who refuses to yield to the genius of his age and to debase himself with childish works, woe unto him. He will die in poverty and oblivion. And that's definitely still true in our time. Most of those people who seek to be um, the one thinking outside of the box, who really seek to be the genius, the unpredictable one, most of those people do not uh, receive great reward for their product. He says, though, 
If only this were a prognostication I am making, and not an experience I report. Carl, Pierre, the moment has come when that brush destined to increase the, majest the majesty of our temples with sublime and sacred images will fall from your hands, or it will be prostituted to decorate the panels of a carriage with lascivious paintings. And you rival the likes of Praxiteles and Ophidius, you whose chisel the ancients would have utilized to make gods capable of excusing their idolatry in our eyes. Inimitable Pigal, your hand will bring itself to sculpting the belly of a grotesque figurine, or it must remain idle. So he's saying, even those then, if you want to flourish in the sciences and the arts, you must do what is already uh, considered to be favorable, what is already considered the general taste. And think about that with uh, our modern uh, music industry. What's the kind of music that makes the most amount of money, where people can actually afford to do it? It's pop music. It's that music which has been commodified, which can be easily played again and regurgitated, and it's, it's short, it's roughly two to three minutes, and it can be used for all sorts of advertisements, and it can be played on the radio, and it's a nice 4-4 beat, nothing too complicated. There's something degrading Rousseau is saying about what it then takes in civilization to flourish in the sciences and the arts. So even though it's an improvement, again, he's saying there's this paradox where actually, yeah, maybe our technology gets better, like he was talking about the brushes and the techniques we learn, but yet what we produce, he thinks, becomes uh, more and more something of the common denominator, this kind of general uh, thing which is aesthetically pleasing to all so you can get paid for your work and not live in poverty. So Rousseau asks, what then precisely is at issue in this question of luxury? To know what is more important for empires? To be brilliant and transito transitory or virtuous and lasting? What is more important for civilization more generally? To be truly morally good and, and, and promote the virtues? Or to be brilliant and transitory? And think about the time Rousseau is in, where it is uh, at, at really uh, beginning to turn in terms of colonialism, where Great Britain is now beginning to uh, spread around the world, and you've already got, of course, Spain and Portugal, who had conquered part of uh, East Asia and you know all of South America and Central America. And behind it is this idea, which seemed noble, that, oh, well, the West is going to promote civilization. It's going to civilize the savages. But what actually happens? The enslavement of human beings around the world, mass atrocities. What? irony in this idea that uh, the empires that are being uh, that are spreading around the world on the basis of the enlightenment are committing some of the greatest atrocities ever committed up to that point in human history and still even think about in our time this idea that well through progress uh, you know we in the enlightenment in, with enlightenment values and human rights well we improve uh, throughout the world and we get better and, and violence decreases throughout time and there's less poverty throughout time. But let's just look at the last century, the 20th century. The 20th century involved two world wars, almost the destruction of all of humanity with uh, mutually assert, assured destruction and the Cold War, right? The nuclear arms race. It involved uh, imperialism throughout the entire world. It involved multiple coups of governments overthrowing them for the sake of markets and resources. Um, is that something that shows definitively that the promotion of the arts and sciences has produced a, a, a greater, uh, you know, moral aptitude in humanity? Well, I think Rousseau would say no, that that's actually to the contrary. So 
So then we turn to uh, specifically to look at not just um, historical inductions, right, examples throughout history, but in turning to look at the arts and the sciences themselves. In this, we have an example about how Rousseau is saying, well, the arts and the sciences actually seem to promote style over substance. So he writes, from where do all these abuses arise? if not from the fatal inequality introduced among men by the distinction of talents and by the degradation of virtues. This is the most obvious effect of all our studies and the most dangerous of all their consequences. It is no longer asked of a man whether he has integrity, but whether he has talents, or of a book whether it is useful, but whether it is well written. Rewards are bestowed on the witty, and virtue remains without honors. There are a thousand prizes for fine discourses, none for fine actions. And think uh, among yourself for a moment here. Is that true? Can you think of examples in your life where, you know, things are praised for uh, the way in which it's written as opposed to what actually it's arguing or how useful it is? Or that prizes are usually given out more for whether it's witty or sounds good as opposed to whether or not someone was good or was a good person. So, what is Rousseau arguing here? Well, of course he's arguing, no, that the um, resurgence of the arts and the sciences has not resulted in the improvement of human morals, but actually has done the opposite. This, in the, the first discourse, the discourse on the arts and the sciences, uh, this is actually the beginning of what then, in the second discourse, the discourse on the origins of inequality, we see he gives actually an account of the state of nature. So remember, we saw this account of the state of nature with Thomas Hobbes, where uh, you know, before government, before civilization, humans are naturally selfish and, and we're bad. And then with law, we're mostly good but and, and peaceful, but of course, uh, it, we use reason to know, well, we would prefer to live under government because, you know, we get like an assurance that our property is protected. Well, Rousseau offers his own theory of the state of nature. And he does so because, uh, besides answering this question posed again uh, for a prize essay contest, because it also grounds uh, his entire argument in the first discourse as to why the sciences and the arts have not improved uh, the morals of humanity. So he says, If I am obligated to do no harm to my fellow human being, it is less because he is a rational being than because he is a sensitive being. That it is not with the use of reason that we see what is good and what we should promote, but instead, Rousseau is kind of speaking to a moral sentimentalism, saying that, really, moral goodness originates in our human nature and our ability to sympathize with fellow human beings, and not just because uh, I've gotten better at understanding logic. So, what is his argument then about the state of nature? Well, what he calls savage man, this human being who lives in the state of nature, is one who is actually not uh, evil like Hobbes, and not really um, naturally good in that we understand virtue, but instead human beings, he argues, are more amoral, that they uh, exist to really kind of promote their own well-being, and they don't seek to cause others pain, but it's not because they understand what good is and they want to promote good. Additionally, uh, human beings in the state of nature, he argues, are politically free, because of course there is no government uh, telling them what they can do, and there are no customs um, also indirectly telling people how they ought to act and how they should not act. But instead, human beings are actually metaphysically determined, though, that 
as he says savage man only pursues rules prescribed by nature or instinct. That the only operations of the soul are to desire or not to desire. That in that way, we are more similar to non-rational animals. And what distinguishes human beings in the state of nature is pity. This natural feeling which contributes to the mutual preservation of the entire species. That for Rousseau, when a human being in the state of nature sees another human being uh, get injured and suffer, that that human being in the state of nature is able to have pity and, and is actually uh, overtaken, overwhelmed by this pity to put themselves by empathizing in the shoes of the other person and suffer with them. And that is why they do not seek to harm other human beings. Now that, let's juxtapose it with civilized man, where again, going back to that quote, man is born free and yet everywhere is in chains. So on the contrary, which we already know, Rousseau is arguing civilization actually makes us immoral. Metaphysically, he says, yeah, we're free because we can use reason. We're not just controlled by our instincts, but that comes at a cost. Politically and morally, we are enslaved. That we feel still the same impetus of nature, but we recognize that we are free to resist by the consciousness of our own freedom. And this creates a kind of disconnect. Um, this actually creates, maybe this is an early example of, um, uh, uh, what am I looking for here? Um, uh, of e uh, existential angst and existential fear. Additionally, he argues civilized man is dangerously reliant on society because we, we rely so much then on the arts and the sciences to tell us what to do, we can no longer actually rely on instincts to just live. And that at any point in time when we get older and technology changes too much for us, we become more stupid, he says, than man in the state of nature. And finally, society has negatively changed our tolerance of danger and harm. That civilized man can dismiss a fellow human being, you know, being killed, being assassinated, and put it bay the nature that would cause him to identify with that person. That there is something about what society has trained us to do to have less pity, to have less empathy and sympathy with our fellow human beings suffering because, well, for society, it's more useful. If, if we're constantly succumbed by, uh, you know, sympathizing with our fellow human beings, we won't get anything done. By contrast, savage man, without the aid of reason and wisdom to allow us to uh, kind of bracket or suspend our pity, is always seen heedlessly yielding to the first feeling of humanity. And in that way, Rousseau is arguing, savage man, human beings in the state of nature are in a way more human than civilized human beings. So specifically, uh, ha Rousseau has a critique of Hobbes here, with, with, of course, more generally than just simply uh, he thinks that human beings in the state of nature aren't naturally selfish or evil. Uh, but specifically in regard to Hobbes, that Hobbes' description of the egoism and selfishness of human beings and the harm done to other human beings through the aid of the passions is correct. That Rousseau thinks Hobbes accurately uh, described the way in which human beings behave. However, Rousseau thinks Hobbes describes man and society as opposed to the state of nature. That as where for Hobbes, it was before government we were bad and government saves us. Rousseau says, no, government enslaves us and worsens us. And actually government makes us selfish as opposed to um, keeping us at bay from one another and, and without letting our selfish instincts tear each other apart. The main idea here um, that you should really understand that 
it helps, I, I think, understand his argument in the first discourse, why the arts and the sciences don't improve our, our morals, and, and why here he, he has this argument about the state of nature, and this argument about Hobbes, is this idea about self-love. So Rousseau speaks of two different terms for self-love, and that for Hobbes, when he des describes glory and egoism and selfishness, that that is artificial, that Naturally, human beings are born with this amour de soi, this love of oneself. So, uh, in French, the literal translation of amour de soi is love of self. And this love of self is simply just a love of our preservation, that we don't want to die, and we seek to ensure our, our well-being is kept. But we don't do so at the expense of other human beings. Contrast to that, Civilization has introduced another kind of love of the self, and this is the artificial one which creates glory. And that is a more propre, a prideful vanity, a prideful or vain love of the self, where I start to see myself through the views of other human beings, and I start to understand myself, and I start to love myself based on what other people think about me. And in, when that happens, Rousseau says, that is when I am enslaved by the customs and manners of society, because I no longer feel free to be the genius and to be spontaneous, but instead I am bound by uh, the thoughts and opinions other people have of me. And instead, society and I too then begin to promote vanity. And that is when I become selfish. So again, of Hobbes, Rousseau says that he has improperly included in savage man's care for his self-preservation the need to satisfy a large number of passions which are the product of society and which have made, actually, laws necessary. So that all those passions, Hobbes says, exist in the state of nature of being selfish and gluttonous and wanting glory, all of that, Rousseau says, is created by civilization. And then when that is created by us living together in society, we actually do need laws. Because laws then are the only way that we'll keep in check our free reign of that war of all against all. So maybe I hope you're starting to see the uh, paradoxical nature here of uh, Rousseau's philosophy and why um, people for centuries now have found Rousseau absolutely fascinating. Uh, so to conclude then what I'm calling the preliminary investigation here of uh, human nature and the state of nature, uh, I, I do want to read one final quote from Rousseau. So this is towards the end of the first part of the second discourse. And Rousseau writes, Without needlessly drawing out these details, everyone must see that, since the bonds of servitude are formed only by the mutual dependence of uh, men and by the reciprocal needs that unite them, it is impossible to enslave a man without first having put him in the position of being unable to do without another. Right? That you can't, he says, it doesn't make sense why someone would willingly walk into civilization and walk into chaining themselves when before they were entirely free. And as Rousseau says, it was a generally peaceful existence. How did that happen? He says, a situation which, since it does not exist in the state of nature, leaves everyone in it free from the yoke and renders vain the law of the stronger. So in the next video lecture, we'll turn to the second part, the second part of the second discourse, where we will see the argument Rousseau has for why it is human beings went from the state of nature to civilization, how it is human beings enslaved themselves, how it is human beings began to corrupt themselves morally. And then we will also see Rousseau's uh, solution for, while well, he's going to argue, we can't ever revert back to the state of nature, we can at least try to mitigate the promotion of 
um, the, uh, vices. And that is where we'll see uh, where he promotes the concept of um, the, the general will. 